process. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, this next session of uh, a, a visitor talk um, with the IFLS. Uh, we have Amy Barlow here. I'll ask Amy, uh, as in previous um, sessions, to say more about her work in general and what she's working on at this particular point. Um, just uh, the usual um, a point that the uh, talk is uh, being recorded. Uh, Amy is a PhD student here at York in political science. She's working on um, the national security and how basically a um, misguided concept of um, gender and women, Muslim women in particular, both as victims or perpetrators, has been built into national um, security and further possibly victimized. I'm adding this part, but I let um, Amy correct me if I'm wrong. Victimized um, Muslim, Muslim women and they stereotype them um, in a way that does not really help the national security either. So the um, and net cost of uh, the, uh, this misconception basically is both for national security and for Muslim women. Um, Amy, if I could just leave it Sorry, to you. Sorry, hang on, hold on one minute, Fiona. Did you want to say something? Hello? Yes, Fiona, Do can we... you go ahead? Can you hear us? Maybe if you can hear us, can put your point or comment in the chat. I wonder if she can't hear. Oh, well. Okay, um, Hengame, please go ahead. They can hear you. Okay, great. So, Amy, I think um, with this, I just leave it um, into your hands to say um, something more about your general work and then this particular project and then um, start with the presentation um, itself. I look forward to it. Thanks. Sure. Um, first, let me share my screen just so I. Um, okay, can you see my screen okay? Everyone? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, and I apologize for the uh, next slide showing. I'm not really sure what that's all about, but it's fine. Um, okay, so thank you so much for the introduction and for providing me with the opportunity to present um, my research um, project with all of you. I, I'm truly honored to be among such a talented group of women. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, first read uh, an Indigenous land acknowledgement and then I'll, I'll provide sort of a little brief um, um, comment on my overall research, um, and then I'll, I'll move into the presentation. Um, so this is an Indigenous land acknowledgement by Adrian Wong. Uh, since our activities are shared digitally through the internet, let's take a moment to consider the legacy of colonialism embedded within the technology structures and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. <clears throat> Even the technologies that are central to much of the work that we do leaves a significant carbon footprint contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time <clears throat> and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization and allyship. So it's important to mention, I, I'm, I'm not a legal scholar, but rather a, a scholar of politics. 
who specializes in international relations and national security, particularly within a North American setting. Broadly speaking, the, the aim of my research is to broaden and deepen the traditional Westphalian understanding of national security to include the features of human security. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept, um, human security is people-centered. It seeks to incorporate security concerns that include economics, food, health, the environment, personal, community, and political security into national security directives. Theorists who study international relations from this perspective often investigate how people are affected by um, um, or what the impacts are of issues like uh, asymmetric conflict, refugees, terrorism, climate change, um, poverty and pandemics, often through a critical lens. The paper that, the, um, that I'm, the, the research that I'm presenting today is actually an extension of my doctoral work. So for the purposes of clarity, my talk will proceed as follows. In the first section, I will introduce the topic, my theoretical frame, the thesis methodology defined six interrelated concepts um, that are central to my argument, that of race, racialization, racism, intersectionality, implicit racial bias, and my concept of settler nationalism. In the second section, I'll discuss my findings that seek to answer the research question of where does the essentialized perception of the religiously observant Muslim women woman stem from? What are the mechanisms that enable its entrenchment in society? And what are the implications of this entrenchment? I'll then provide some concluding remarks and answer any questions that anybody might have. Okay, so um, seriously, okay, it worked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, it's well established that Islamophobia in the West has very old roots. However, the, the events of 9 11, the war on terror, the fight against ISIS, and the domestic threat of the lone actor terrorist have resulted in an unprecedented level of Islamophobia in Canada and the United States. This fear is a result <clears throat> of the social construction of the so-called Islamic fundamentalist terrorist. And by extension, anyone who is Arab or Muslim is considered to be dangerous. In both countries, the religiously observant Muslim woman has been discursively and essentialized. She is linguistically and re visually represented as an infantilized requires white male protection, white settler male protection from Muslim men in her religion, while simultaneously being vilified, sexualized, and othered by the white settler population. To the white settler, her religious observance is envisioned as a sign of her presumed subjugation and the barbar barbarity, backwardness, and violence that is mistakenly thought to accompany Islam. She is subjected to everyday violence by white settlers and settler colonial agents. She is understood to be both victim and perpetrator. The white settler gaze imagines her very presence in society as a tangible threat, as she is perceived to embody a negation of the values of the West. Through, the lens, <laughs> through this lens, violence against her is deemed permissible and justifiable. This false representation has become an entrenched norm in society and has increasingly emboldened white nationalist inspired acts of terrorism. The talk that I'm giving today is based on a paper that is um, a comparative case study where I seek to expose the mechanisms that inadvertently but simultaneously work together to create a false image of the religiously observant Muslim woman as a threat to Western values, norms, and society in Canada and the United States. Through the lens of critical race theory and post-colonial theory and the method of critical discourse analysis, I examine the ways in which the highly racialized and gendered language found in governmental discourses, mainstream media frames, and legal instruments act as a productive and reproductive force. I argue that each stage of this process further entrenches an essentialized image that while highly flawed becomes a seemingly self-evident norm to much of the white settler 
population in both countries. I argue further um, <coughs> that this essentialized stereotype is the result of deeply entrenched implicit racial bias and settler nationalism that causes a myopic view of threats among government officials, governmental officials and others, and has given rise to everyday violence against Muslim women and has emboldened white nationalist terrorist acts. Um, this conceptualization constitutes a positive feedback loop, whereby the first factor of governmental rhetoric increases the impact of the second factor, uh, mainstream media frames, which strengthens, uh, uh, which then informs the third factor of legal instruments, which then reaffirms and strengthens the position of the first factor. Um, it's noteworthy to mention that despite the increase in instances of white nationalist inspired terrorism, um, which were identified over 10 years ago by various intelligence agencies as the most significant national security threat to North America, the topic remains under theorized in the critical terrorism literature and national security policies and directives, which is where I'm making my, my intervention. So the concepts, there are six interrelated concepts that are central to my work. They under, underpin my theory of essentialization that seeks to explain why these false perceptions are generated and maintained over time. The concepts are race, racialization, racism, intersectionality, implicit, um, implicit racial bias, and uh, settler nationalism. For those of you who are already familiar with these these terms, I apologize. However, having a clear understanding of them at the outset is critical to understanding the analysis that follows. So um, based on Isaki's 2016 definition, race, as we know, is not a biological difference. Uh, the category is actually a social construction that is based on phenotypical differences, language, clothing, culture, beliefs, and religion. The process of the social construction of race is referred to as racialization, which is the manner in which societies differentiate people from each other um, <clears throat> through unequal opportunities that affect economic, political, and social life. Based on a premise of superiority and inferiority, it has been used as a justification for colonialism, imperialism, enslavement, capitalist accumulation, and state policies and practices that exclude, discriminate, and marginalize certain groups while privileging others. Um, racism is defined as the discrimination of a person based on their race. Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality draws attention to the ways in which race and other factors such as gender, class, and sexuality intersect, overlap, and are mutually constituted. Racism and different intersectionalities permeate all um, facets of society, causing significant harm. Implicit racial bias refers to the ways in which people make race-based assumptions on a day-to-day -day basis about who a person is, based on virtually no information other than their appearance. These biases are informed by stereotypes that are made visible through various social interactions, the language that we use, and the institutional structures that comprise the settler colonial countries of Canada and the United States. Racial bias assumes difference rather than similarity, even when similarity is far more likely with respect to values, family, education, careers, and general interests. It poisons a binary view of us and them, of what is safe and what is dangerous, what is accepted as knowledge production and what is not, whose experiences matter and whose are discounted, and what is to be respected and what is to be disrespected. It's actually a cognitive short, shortcut that is informed by a deeply ingrained set of essentialist assumptions that are built on a foundation of white supremacy. As critical race theorists remind us, the over racist is not necessary in such a conceptual conceptualization as racism exists and persists in the very fabric of society. Um, the next definition is a concept that I developed for my doctoral work. 
it's called settler nationalism. Um, similar to uh, implicit racial bias, it's deeply ingrained in the societal and institutional structures of the settler colonial countries of Canada and the United States. Drawing on Gramsci's notion of cultural hegemony, settler nationalism begins with the state who forges a mythological meta-narrative based on a common set of assumed societal values that become an unquestionable norm. Settler nationalism is a particular type of nationalism that is pervasive in North America. It's rooted in the overarching and underlying belief in the supremacy of whiteness and that white settlers are the rightful heirs to the colonized land. In both countries, it is an ideology based <clears throat> on the myth of it, 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 it's a white settler origin narrative that envisions um, the countries as being born from the labor of white settlers who forged a home in a rugged and unforgiving land. In this myth, white settlers are seen as the chosen ones ordained from God to bring civilization to the harsh lands that are home to a barbaric and infantile people. Both countries are imagined to have been conceived from the sweat of white settlers' brows and the broadness of their backs, whereby their hard work and thrift brought great rewards. In some, it is the Protestant ethic, and it is understood as a virtuous white ethic. In the United States, the myth is rooted in the vision of the shining city on the hill, whereby industry, ingenuity, and commerce through capitalism descends from the hard work of far forebearers. In short, the meta narrative. The myth of the meta narrative is manifest destiny, whereby uh, golden ages and the chosen people provide the symbolic creation of America. Finally, in both countries, capitalism, democracy, and eventually neoliberalism are realized, and all the benefits are bestowed on the white settler as the rightful heirs of the land. This meta narrative, uh, these meta narratives, extol the seemingly inherent virtues of an idealized form of whiteness that measures all other races and classes against it. These meta narratives are very old, but continue to resonate, slightly more morphing over time, but they retain the vestiges of their origins through each iteration. The accounts filter through society by way of trusted public figures, schools, um, churches, literature, poetry, television programs, movies, the mainstream media and social media, valorizing a specific type of whiteness that finds traction with each retelling. The stories permeate each layer of society, weaving their way into the very fabric of society. The myth is ingrained in the psyche of the white settler, becoming natural, inevitable, a seemingly incontrovertible truth, whereby the white settler considers themselves and their descendants to be cho the chosen ones who are destined to be the rightful heirs to the land. This myth mythological, these mythological narratives are produced and reproduced from one generation to the next, constituting cultural hegemony that is, that is steeped in cr Christian religiosity and systems of white supremacy. In Canada, we are currently presented with the latest manifestation of this meta narrative that continues to celebrate earlier version, but now poisons the country as good, inclusive, and colorblind. It is the nation that welcomes everyone. A similar meta narrative permeates the United States as well, that envisions itself to be the caretaker of the globe, who brings democracy, human rights, and neoliberal economic systems to all. However, the structures that underpin both Can Canadian and American societies have retained. <coughs> their racialized white supremacist origins that favor a particular type of whiteness that is the physical embodiment of the capitalist neoliberal norms and ideals. This physical embodiment is one that is white, educated, moneyed, and heteronormative. It sows division amongst the races through the myth of difference, making us believe that the difference is based on race rather than class. Everyone is measured against this elite typology of whiteness and most fall short. In keeping with Gramsci, the system actively encourages the widespread belief that in a capitalist system, hard work and thrift will be rewarded with economic and social mobility, which equals success. However, these seemingly 
self-evident beliefs actually reinforce the social and economic structures by fostering the notion that those who have garnered success have done so in a fair and just manner, and that those who are left on the margins are there because of their own ineptitude and personal failings, rather than the structural arrangements of the system. As a result, the reality of life experienced by experienced every day by Indigenous peoples, communities of colour and poor whites is one that is left wanting. These communities are actively excluded from the neoliberal system on purpose, but are blamed for their own expulsion and marginalization. Their generalized internalization of the underlying causes of their plight embeds the hegemonic culture. The meta narrative is a myth. It denies the extreme levels of violence, genocide, exclusion, discrimination, and racism of the past and present that existed, that existed and continues to persist in both countries and the structures and institutions that maintain systems of exclusion and uh, oppression that are rooted in the belief of the supremacy of whiteness. It is a logic of supremacy. Settler nationalism as an ideology is both explicitly and implicitly violent. It, along with race, racialization, racism, intersectionality, and implicit racial bias are the underlying explanatory mechanisms that enable me to understand and therefore explain the governmental, among others, my, myopic preoccupation with the so-called Islamic fundamentalist terrorist threat and the religiously observant Muslim woman, rather than focusing on the clear and present danger of white nationalist inspired terrorism. It also simultaneously explains the rise in white nationalist inspired terrorism. So the findings, um, I just wanna take a few minutes to just go over a few points of critical discourse analysis or CDA. Um, CDA is particularly useful in making the seemingly invisible visible. Language is incredibly powerful. It provides us with meaning and context. It enables to under, us to understand the world in which we live. Language has the ability to inspire great acts of bravery, kindness, and generosity. It also has the ability to vilify, dehumanize, and other those among us who are deemed threatening and dangerous. One, if not the primary concern of CDA is how power differentials impact specific groups in society through the constructed nature of specific discourses. Consequently, CDA theorists are concerned with analyses um, that center on what the conditions of power are, how the organization of power regimes in society are formed, and the various outcomes of these regimes particularly in relation to the marginalization of certain groups. Leany Hansen's 2006 conceptual lenses of spatiality, temporality, and ethicality um, aid in this process. Spatiality refers to the manner in which identity is formed by way of binaries of us and them. The United States and Canada share a history of a meta narrative of racial difference that results in a biased premise um, uh, based on the notion of racial superiority through binaries. Temporality refers to the way in which racial bias moves through time vis-a-vis -vis flows of information and how this is understood and processed by people in this geographic region. Ethicality refers to the ways in which identity and difference are constructed and understood in ethical terms, such as protecting the innocent from evil. Each of these lenses are vital to uncovering the political nature of identi identity construction. They are not one dimensional, but rather work in conjunction with each other. It is through anal an analysis of the conversion of convergence of these lenses that my work reveals how racial bias through the ideology of settler nationalism is produced and reproduced over time in specific narratives. So the narratives. The narratives include, as previously mentioned, um, governmental discourses, mainstream media frames and legal instruments. This has been a particularly fruitful line of inquiry as it has enabled me to expose the productive and reproductive mechanisms that generate the seemingly 
commonsensical truth claims that underpin the false perception of the religiously observant Muslim woman as a threat to society in North America. Each of these narratives are deeply connected to a post 9-11 national security narrative that is both highly racialized and gendered. Moreover, these narratives can be understood as stages that converge, resulting in the entrenchment of racialized and gendered essentializations. My contention is that each of these stages linguistically generate context and meaning through a deeply ingrained lens of implicit racial bias and settler nationalism. The end result is a seemingly commonsensical, largely unquestioned norm, at least within the general population. I argue that this process constitutes a positive, positive feedback loop. As previously mentioned, this, this occurs when the first factor of governmental rhetoric increases the impact of the second factor, mainstream media, which then increases the impact of the third factor, legal instruments, which then increases the intensity of the first factor by reaffirming its strength and position. Due to time constraints, I'll only provide a few examples of the racialized and gendered language found in each of these, um, these stages. Governmental rhetoric acts as the starting point for framing the narratives, not the actual event itself. In other words, um, it is how the governmental officials linguistically frame and contextualize the event that provides understanding. It is a process of locating the positionality of the event in question in terms of either inducing calm or fear in the general public. Since 9-11, governmental rhetoric in both countries has been fear-based and framed in a binary of us and them, a war being waged between good and evil. These binaries are used to describe the seemingly inherent violence that is presumed to accompany the Islamic faith that was, in essence, claimed to be the reason for 9-11. President Bush framed those responsible for the attacks, the attacks as the enemy within and the enemy without, and set a tone for a highly racialized and gendered response to the attacks. On the evening of 9-11, President Bush made his first official address to the nation and the world, stating that, and I quote, today our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, fires burning, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. America was targeted for, for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the very best of America. At first glance, um, President, Bush, President Bush's words seemed fitting in light of the catastrophic events. However, if we, if we look closer at the language, a, he uses words such as evil, terror, sadness, disbelief, unyielding anger, and that we were targeted because we were good and the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity. Such language captures the anguish and the grief that was felt by Americans on that day. The subsequent discursive framing of identifying who is a danger and who is not is situated directly within the context of 9-11. It is from this perspective that fear of the other is presented as a way to make sense of what has happened. <clears throat> And indeed, what could happen in the future if we are not vigilant? At the time, no other factors were considered, and those who dared proffer alternative explanations that centered on terrorism as being political, social, or an economic act were swiftly shut down. The ubiquity of the ever-present potential of violence from the so-called Islamic fundamentalist terrorist generates an understanding that produces a widespread belief that any Muslim male is potentially a threat and dangerous. In contrast to the depiction of the dangerous and violent Muslim male, 
is the trope of the religiously observant Muslim woman who is thought to be subjugated, docile, powerless, and without agency. This is embraced and reinforces the seemingly in, inherent barbarity of the so-called Islamic fundamentalist terrorist, and by extension, all Muslim men. These narratives continue over time and are espoused at the outset of and during the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan during President Obama's tenure, despite his attempt to move away from this language, um, and are then resuscitated with fierce vigor by President Trump. Um, the next entrenchment phase is the mainstream media frames. Um, and while the governmental rhetoric acts as a starting point, the mainstream media coverage, both from the right and left, further entrenches highly racialized and gendered stereotypes through a never ending 24 hour news cycle. The mainstream media, both print and televised, have been heavily criticized for inducing a level of fear in the general population that has been likened to that during, of that during the Red Scare. After 9-11, the media provided a narrative of the events that transpired, why they occurred, who the perpetrators might be, and why we should be afraid. It was a narrative that was and continues to be easily understandable, relying heavily on binaries and stereotypes. There is no doubt that the media coverage of the events of 9-11 was unprecedented. It has been referred to by Kellner 2004 as spectacle broadcast. It aired in a continual loop whereby the horror of 9-11 was broadcast to the world. The planes hitting the World Trade Center, towers and their subsequent collapse were shown again and again and again. The images of the burning towers, the horror of people jumping from the buildings, the rubble, dust, and pieces of floating paper were surreal and became images that were burned into Americans' mind. From this convergence, Kellner 2004 notes, and I quote, that the spectacle conveyed a message that the US was vulnerable to a terror attack, that terrorists could great create great harm and that anyone at any time could be subject to a deadly terror attack, even fortress America, end quote. The mainstream me media co-opted the highly flawed and racist Huntingtonian clash of civilizations thesis, rooting their, their narratives in the binaries of us and them, good and evil. Such narratives were pervasive, highly racialized and brought to the fore. <clears throat> the underlying fear that Muslims are dangerous. Once again, we are presented with the essentialized tropes of the Muslim man, and in contrast to his danger, comes the image of the re religiously observant Muslim woman, who is conti continually free, um, portrayed as a woman without agency who is oppressed. There's no shortage of media stories that use essentialized language and images. They are easily found in the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the Toronto Sun, the National Post, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, ABC, Fox, CBS, and many, many, many others. Headlines such as free to choose, unveiling freedom, the unveiled threat, inferred that that Muslim women's religiosity is not their choice, but rather a cultural defect, and that she is actually a victim of brutish and misogynistic men who impose their will and religion upon her. She is envisioned as a homogeneous woman, not an individual. There is no variation and there is no agency. In addition to the liberation themes that the press embraces, there is the protection theme, which is prevalent wherein media stories of so-called honor killings and honor violence is framed of, as proof of the barbarity of Islamic faith. Um, rather, and, and Muslim men, rather than incidences of domestic violence. These stories produced and reproduced by the mainstream media, both on the right and left, over the past 20 years, they've taken on a life of their own and provide a highly skewed perspective that becomes deeply entrenched in society. The final stage of entrenchment is the legal instruments. And the legal instruments that I have examined include Quebec's Bill 21 and various anti-Sharia law bills in the United States. 
These legal instruments act as the final stage of the societal entrenchment of the essentialized perception of the religiously observant um, Muslim woman. It's widely acknowledged that Quebec's Bill 21, um, as it's officially referred to an act respecting the laicity of the state, while harmful and discriminatory to other groups, it is actually directly aimed at religiously observant Muslim women who wear the niqab. For the purposes of clarity, the bill prohibits public servants, contractors, prosecutors, and public school teachers from wearing religious symbols. According to chapter two of the bill, it includes, and I quote, um, religious symbols are any object, including clothing, a symbol, jewelry, an adornment, an accessory headwear that is one worn in connection with religious conviction or belief, or two is reasonably considered as referring to a religious affiliation, end quote. The bill and its defenders frame it as the means of acting in the interest of the public. It is couched in terms of reconciling Quebec's troubled history with the Catholic Church. However, the questions remain, whose interest in the public is being upheld and why? What, who is being protected and from whom? And why are women who cover their faces and heads considered to be such a threat? Um, the language used in this bill is revealing insofar as it repeatedly refers, refers to religious garments that cover one's face. There is little doubt about who this targets, uh, Muslim women who wear the niqab. For example, section eight, nine, and 10 of chapter two explicitly refers to the covering of one face. Um, moreover, all of chapter three is devoted to the uncovering of one's face. And chapter four, section 14 is the same. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association, among others, have challenged the bill, citing it as being unconstitutional and in direct conflict with minority rights as described under the charter. While these challenges continue to move through the courts, the public perception of the bill is largely favorable. This has to do with this, this deeply ingrained misperception of the religiously observant Muslim woman as oppressed and her unveiling as freeing her. With respect to the anti-Sharia law bills in the United States, the Southern Poverty Law Center, or the SPLC, has compiled a list of bills that have been introduced in 43 states out of a total of 50 states. In 2017 alone, 14 states introduced anti-Sharia law bills and Texas and Arkansas enacted the legislation. The SPLC, among others, have noted that the introduction of this type of legislation is largely due to the success of rights of right wing conspiracies that have achieved achieved mainstream um, status. The primary one centers on the notion that so called Sharia law will take over American law and bring jihad with it. Spurred by far right organizations such as the American Freedom Law Center and the ACT for America, two groups that have been designated by the SPLC as hate groups have capitalized on the Islamophobia that exists in the population and have embraced politicians who are willing to take table this legislation. Once again, the issue is framed in racialized and gender terms that are aimed at protecting Muslim women who are viewed as helpless, misguided, and subjugated by Muslim men and their religion. Sharia law, as the SPLC and others have pointed out, is in fact a misnomer. It is not a set of laws, but rather guiding principles. Irrespective of this fact, 201 anti-Sharia law bills were introduced and framed in an effort to, and I quote, protect American citizens from foreign legal doctrines especially Islamic Sharia law. The traction of this sort of legislation is greatly troubling as it's not based on fact, but rather a fear of an imagined law and an imagined enemy. However, the harm is quite real. In Tennessee, the language used in the Senate bill of 1028 states the following, and I quote, the threat from Sharia based jihad and terrorism presents a real and present danger to the lawful governance of the state and to the peaceful enjoyment of the citizens of the citizenship by the residents of this state. 
The bill authorizes the Attorney General to designate Sharia organizations defined as two or more persons conspiring to support or acting in concert in support of Sharia or in furtherance of the imposition of Sharia within any state or territory in the United States. Anyone who provides material support or resources to a designated Sharia organization could be charged with a felony and face up to 15 years in jail. The, legal, the legislation discussed in this section is the result of two decades worth of entrenched Islamophobia in North America. It is the final act of the institutionalization of a set of beliefs and norms that are not rooted in reality, but rather are indicative of the existence of widespread essentialized disordered perception of Islam as a religion and its adherence as a clear and present danger to society. The existence of the, of the language used in the legislation reveals the depth and degree to which Islamophobia has been internalized as a commonsensical norm to those in positions of power, but also the public at large who vote for these politicians who represent their concerns, all of which are under, underpinned by implicit ra uh, racial bias and the ideology of settler nationalism. In conclusion, my work demonstrates that the post 9-11 racialized and gendered narratives found in governmental rhetoric, mainstream media frames, and legal instruments act as a productive and reproductive force that provides an essentialized perception of the rig religiously observant Muslim woman. Each of these mechanisms systematically entrenches false norms in society, particularly in white settler society. 20 years after 9-11, these false narratives persist, easily finding traction in, in an atmosphere of fear and uncertainty. The myopia caused by these norms has prevented policymakers and others from recognizing the very serious threat of white nationalist terrorism. This myopia is explained by uh, widespread implicit racial bias and settler nationalism, whereby the only terrorist threat that exists in Canada and the United States is one that is Muslim and is certainly never white. There is certainly, excuse me, there is little doubt that we are at a critical juncture and the investigation into these issues is of acute significance. It is my sincere hope that my research will add in breaking down the barriers of racial prejudice, gender bias, and contribute to an emerging narrative who's the, which, the aim of which is to foster a conversation that will enable imprudent political policymaking while making a substantial contribution to the critical terrorism literature. So that is my talk. If anybody has any questions, I would love to hear them. Thanks so much, Amy. I'm sorry I can't get my... Um camera to work. I think Lisa has, did Lisa have a question? Sorry, I thought there was a raised hand. Leah, maybe you can not raise. Sorry, hang on me. I thought, I, I, I thought there was a raised hand, but maybe you can moderate if there are any questions. I have a question, but I'll see if there are any before that. There are no hands at the moment. Okay. So Amy, maybe I can start by um, asking you a question about um, a possible, probably a possibly different way of looking at this. So the way I understand the project is, or at least the way the description um, in your bio suggests is to look at the way Muslim women have been uh, analyzed in an instrumentalist way in the interest of national security. And so at times they've been victimized at times, so at, at times they have been um, introduced as victims, at times as perpetrators. And in the end, obviously both approaches are unrealistic. None gives any agency to Muslim women both are a slightly more sophisticated version of a stereotypical uh, views on the street. 
And in the end, that neither serves the interest of Muslim women nor national security. But the way I heard you then present the subject, obviously there is a lot more um, uh, theoretical um, uh, background presented as it should be. But this literature that you present um, a snapshot, a snapshot of it could actually apply to any other subject. So you could take out Muslim women, yep. put in any other identity group yep. and use the same literature. Yeah. And at some point the question is, okay, so what's the difference? In what way, because it's not, it cannot be the case that all these identity groups are looked at with a, or in an instrumentalist way by foreign policy or you know just in general in the society by the West, by colonialism, by post colonial you know, whatever name you want to add in there. Yeah. It cannot be the case that they are all approached in the same way, right? So yeah. it's useful to use this theoretical framework but then look at the specific ways that they might be different or the specific ways that actually these kind of biases manifest themselves. And I'm just wondering if you have anything to say to that, what are the very specific ways that Muslim women in particular um, have been uh, approached basically under this misguided framework? And then I have a second question on the, uh, uh, definition or role of Sharia, you mentioned that Sharia is not actually a set of rules. And I'm not sure oh. if one could agree with that because Sharia actually does have a very specific set of rules. One could make a case for the argument that, you know, in almost in none of Islamic countries, well, when I say almost, because it's almost, some of them actually fall uh, outside this generalization. But you could say that almost in all Islamic countries, Sharia law is applied in a combination with other legal traditions transplanted into the legal system. So it's very difficult to find pure Sharia law in a doctrinal sense applied almost, again, almost anywhere in the world. So you could make that case to say that you know, legal traditions obviously have influenced one another. There is a uh, transplantation uh, or uh, of, of legal ideas, and that's why it's very difficult to look for anything pure, as it's difficult to look for pure civil law as such in uh, many non-European countries. Um, but now the question is that, so when you, when you say that Sharia is not actually a set of rules, but it's just guidelines and i understand that probably i'm being nitpicky because you know we're speaking about this in the context of a you know law school but what do we actually we mean with that because sharia is or does consist of a set of very precise rules in many um social spheres so if you could speak to both questions sure you would like okay so uh, with respect to your first question um Critical race theory has been used to examine a number of different um, phenomena, and they, it can certainly, of course, it can exam examine any any race. Um, it's been used by a significant number of disciplines to understand um, where um, you know the intersections of oppression exist and expose the seemingly invisible. Um, institutionalization of racism and the structural conditions that enable it to persist within a national security framework, you actually would, it would be challenging in some respects to apply another racial, racialized group to um, the events of 9-11 and um, the national security narratives that I speak of in both Canada and the United States. Um, because of the specific Islamophobic narrative that has been produced and reproduced through 20 years of entrenchment in both countries. 
with respect to, I may have misspoken. I, I said that the Sharia is a set of rules, not laws. And um, what I'm speaking particularly about is Canada and the United States, which actually both countries have legislation that prohibits the introduction of what are considered quote unquote foreign laws. Um, the whole point of that distinction is that the, um, the, the presumption of what Sharia law is in the, the general public at large is largely, it is significantly problematic, right? Um, because it is based on a series of essentialized um, tropes and not an actual understanding. The creation of the laws, the anti-Sharia laws in the United States are a knee-jerk reaction to a fear of an essentialized perception of a dangerous Islamic fundamentalist terrorist. And within that, a, the, the so-called protection of the, um, the religious, the observant Muslim woman as someone who is not um, capable, able, or um, I don't know, understood to be a woman who has agency um, distinct geographic cultural norms. Um, there's all sorts of essentializations that are based on what I refer to as, you know, uh, these are myths, they aren't rooted in reality. So um, I may have misspoke when I was talking um, and said rules, not laws, when I meant to say laws or rules, not laws. Um, and within, you know, perhaps I could have been a little bit more particular within the American and Canadian context, but I appreciate your questions and comments. So can I just go back? Thank you. So can I just go back to the first question? And so if you think about the specifically about national security, it's actually the case that if you look at this as a lay person, and of course, you know, you could look at this as a constitutional law person as well, you could. But as a lay person, if you look at this, Muslim men have probably been the target of such propaganda after September 11 compared to Muslim women. Yeah. So I completely agree with you that, you know, then that implies something else that implies, you know, the uh, conception or, you know, a uh, um, misconception rather that you know Muslim women or women in general could be you know do not have enough agency to be uh, as like to be likely perpetrators and not just victims so Muslim women do not have enough agency to be a source of danger or a sense of risk national security risk that could be and that has another problem then that becomes a completely different problem then what I, if I'm correct, I understand you to, pre, to be presenting that, you know, one side of the story is that, you know, in a, um, a, based on an understanding that is closer to myth than reality, you know, Muslim women have been associated with September 11. So yeah. in some way, actually, you know, there are many, many cases I'm not familiar with the Canadian immigration system, at least at the time, so much as the U.S. In the U.S. immigration system, you know, right after September 11, actually, you know, female students, female Muslim students are coming from Islamic countries, you know, um, they were a lot more likely to get visas than um, male Muslim students. Mm -hmm. And that applied to other kinds of entry visas as well. Mm -hmm. So is it not the question that possibly you know, this defense, this, this uh, worthy project to claim agency for Muslim women is actually attacking the straw man in the context of national security. So if you were working on, you know, Muslim women and family law or Muslim women in the context of the general societal concept, concept of Muslim women and family law in North America, it might have been probably been an easier argument to say that, you know, how this approach, this misconception has actually had, 
you know, a harmful impact on the lives of Muslim women. But I'm not sure if that has been the case when it comes to national uh, security as compared to Muslim men. And then, so the next question you could just respond by saying that I'm not comparing Muslim women to Muslim men, I'm comparing Muslim women to the average population of women in general. Mm -hmm. And then in that case, you know, I would then ask you if gender here is um, being useful at all or, you know, meaningful as a um, source of compounded, compounded discrimination. Is it really a factor here? Oh, yeah, I think so, for sure. I mean, as women, we tend to focus on the, the social construction of, the, of, of gender from um, the standpoint of, of women, but male gender is also a social construct. Um, coming from a background in gender studies, this is, and also, you know, as I, I noted at the outset, I'm not a legal scholar, I'm a political scientist. So I come from this from a political science perspective and a national security understanding of um, the term determining factors of how threats are identified. What is threat perception? How do we understand this? And within that frame, um, my work seeks to demonstrate how these commonsensical essentialized tropes come to the fore and become deeply ingrained and cause a significant amount of harm um, to, to the Muslim population in general, but also to society and to national security directives, there is virtually no money spent on um, investigating and uh, you know, stopping the widespread of white nationalist um, uh, terrorism in Canada and the United States. This has, it came to the fore briefly on January 6th. It comes to the fore briefly with, with a variety of different terrorist acts that occur here at home in London, Ontario, not that long ago. Um, however, by just using the word terrorist with the words white nationalist is not actually addressing the problem. So what my work seeks to do is expose the mechanisms that enable the continuation of um, these essentialist assumptions to continue. So oh. I appreciate that. So th that's that's helpful. Thanks. It's just I'll uh, one very quick follow up, and then I leave it because just um, to see if there are any other questions. Would it not useful to look for probably a more or, or to conduct a more empirical, and by that I don't mean actually empirical in that sense of data, but at least in the sense of stories, incidents, to suggest that, um, or to bear out basically for those stories to bear out the claim made here that these misconceptions have actually caused harm to Muslim women in particular. And I think that's something that I'm hoping to hear in this research that, you know, where is the harm? Yes, the harm is the linguistic, is perpetuation of assumptions is all of that but you know we need as socially responsible academics yeah. we need to actually be able to find actual happenings in the world that correspond to this nice big theoretical frameworks and, you know sophisticated vocabulary and i just don't think in this particular sense when it comes to national security gender has made a huge difference. There is similar work, you may want to look at it. People have started now looking at the um, way women are basically looked at in the context of international criminal law, yeah. right? So that women mostly are considered as victims and rarely as perpetrators. And so what are we doing when they are actually perpetrators, which has been the case you know, in many contexts, um, when they have been perpetr perpetrators of war crimes, crimes against humanity, et cetera, et cetera, what is the subject of international criminal law? 
Um, is there really a difference? Does gender really play a role here at all or not? And I think that that's the kind of work that probably would be worth pursuing here as well, that yeah. in the context of national security, where are, wh what are the actual stories? What are they? And I know this is not legal work, it's political science, but it might be worth looking at actual you know, cases on yeah. their terrorism, constitutional law, et cetera. It's a human rights cases. Mm -hmm. where in Muslim women, the gender of Muslim women has actually been factored in somehow in a plausible way. Yeah, no, that sounds fantastic. I, I love that idea. Thank you. Any other questions? I do have a, not a question, but just want to thank Amy for her presentation, being like a racialized woman as well. It's so informative to come and listen to what you had to share. And I'm hoping to learn more, especially around the whole idea of human security and the national, is it settler nationalism? Mm -hmm. Really interested in that concept. So thank you so much. Thank you, Fiona. Lisa, please go ahead. Lisa. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed this presentation and I want to apologize. I believe my internet. You are cutting out. Can you hear me? You're cutting out a little bit. Oh. I can try. Go ahead. I I'm sorry. I, I think I might. Yes, I apologize. Okay, I will. I will not. I will not. I will not. Can you hear me now? Yes. Lisa, maybe you want to put the question in the chat if that's easy. Okay. Can you hear me now? I really apologize yes. for my internet problems. Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you now. Apologies, everyone. I'll put, I'll put the question in the chat. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your kind words, Fiona. That was very nice of you. I appreciate your comments. Yeah, did Lisa put her comments in or? No, not as yet. Okay. Amy, can you see the question? No. 
So she says, my question is whether it is important to acknowledge the extent to which views of Muslims and Muslim women have changed over time since 9-11. Example, Bill 21 is unpopular across Canada and is losing popularity even in Quebec. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, that uh, that's a great question. And, um, and it has changed over time. Um, and it really has sort of picked up more traction recently of um, people being really against it. Um, the, you know, the poll that I refer to in my talk is, is not that old, but um, I think Lisa brings up a good point of how there is, a, there is nuance to the way that uh, opinions change. Um, and the, and the, that is an important aspect for sure. So thank you, Lisa, if you can hear me for your, your question. If uh, Lisa doesn't have a follow up, I guess there are no other questions. There's one other person who could potentially ask a question. If not, then maybe we can wrap up. Sure. Sorry. Lisa put in one more question. She said, I also think as a legal scholar that Sharia is a legal system. It is a body of law by any reasonable definition of law. Maybe what you mean by saying it is not law is that it is not enforceable through the mechanism of the state. Yeah, and certainly not in Canada or the United States um, within the, the legal mechanisms of the state. Hengame, there are no more questions. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Amy. Good luck with your work. And thank thank you. you so much, Liel, for um, uh, helping with the event. No problem. Thank, thank you, me. everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.